Okay, so thank you everybody for coming to this panel today on uh, 50 years of 1968. Uh, this panel has been done a few times this year, so this is the current iteration. Um, this panel is done in Oregon, in London, in Santa Cruz, last week in Chicago. We're doing it now in Houston, and it will be done again in Chicago. Actually, Bill Ayers is expected to be on the next one in Chicago. And that's important because we're having a conversation in the half uh, centennial of 1968. 1968 was a very uh, intense year with lots of events and uh, lots of controversies. Erwin Unger has a really good introduction to this as well. And so we thought it's an important discussion to have right now uh, for the left as we're looking back upon the left's own history and reflecting on it and um, how it influences us today. So I'm going to read the panel prompt at first that was given uh, to the uh, panelists. Um, I'm just going to read the prompt, not the questions. Um, so for half a century, 1968 has represented a high watermark of social and political transformation, a year of social upheaval that spanned the entire globe. Ushered in by a new left that sought to distinguish itself from the old left that emerged in the 20s and 30s, the monumental events of 1968 set the tone for everything from protest politics to academic leftism. Today, with the U.S. entangled in a seemingly endless war in Asia and people calling for impeachment of an unpopular president, with activists fighting in the streets and calling for liberation along the lines of race, gender, and sexuality, the left's every attempt to discover new methods and new ideas seems to invoke a memory of the political horizons of 1968. We can perhaps more than ever feel the urgency of the question, what lessons are to be drawn from the new left as another generation undertakes the project of building a left for the 21st century? And so I have our panelists here, three of them, um, starting um, to the closest to me. Uh, Dewey uh, Nawan is an assistant professor of world cultures and literatures at the University of Houston. His research focuses on critical theory in Asian popular culture and film. His recent publications uh, include Surveillance and Spectacle in... I can't pronounce this. Oh, boy, I'm good. Okay. Um, alternate Histories of Korean National Sovereignty in 2009, Lost Memories. Against Autonomy, Capitalism Beyond Quantification and the Autonomous Reading of Marx. And The Angel of History and the Commodity Fetish, Walter Benjamin and the Marxian Critique of Capital. Nguyen is currently completing two book projects. The first titled The Unimagined Community, Mass Culture in the Republic of Vietnam, examines Vietnamese culture, literature, and mass culture from the Vietnam War era. Um, the second uh, project explores the work of Vietnamese professor, uh, philosopher Chen Duc Tao and the influence of his materialist <coughs> critique of phenomenology on contemporary critical theory. Um, next, George Ryder. Uh, George Ryder grew up in a working class family in Brooklyn, graduated from Stanford with a PhD in applied physics in 1963. He became active in the anti-war movement of the 60s and helped organize the first peace march in Orange County, California. He was fired from his job as an assistant professor at the University of California at Irvine, spent 10 years moving around the globe do, uh, doing research at institutions in Switzerland, Sweden, Brazil, and the U.S., and arrived in Houston in 1981. He is a professor of physics at the University of Houston and an internationally known physicist. He became active politically again in the early 80s in opposition to the Star Wars Initiative. He is now the co-chair of the Harris County Green Party and the producer and co-host of Thresholds, 7 p.m. on Fridays on KPFT, a show about the possibilities uh, in society. And then finally, David Michael Smith uh, completed three years of undergraduate studies at Princeton University, where he became a Marxist and an activist. After a brush with the law led to his departure from Princeton, he worked as a youth counselor, a political organizer, and a soldier before completing his bachelor's degree in philosophy at Georgia State University. He earned two master's degrees and a doctorate in political science at the City University of New York Graduate School, specializing in political theory and U.S. politics. Dr. Smith has taught at Stevens Institute of Technology, Brooklyn College, LaGuardia Community College, Fordham University, York College, College of the Mainland, and the University of Houston downtown. His writings have appeared in the International Encyclopedia of Revolution and Protest, Peace Review, Impact Press, Vanguardia uh, Dossier, Nature Society and Thought, Marxism Leninism Today, Resistance.org, and other publications. Uh, he is currently writing a book on the human costs of the U.S. Empire titled Endless Holocaust, Dr. Smith and his wife, Rona Smith, have been politically active 
in Texas for 17 years, first with the Progressive Workers Organizing Committee and now with the Houston Socialist Movement. These groups have been very active in opposing the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, organizing large demonstrations against the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazi events, defending day laborers against armed anti-immigrant vigilantes, protesting against Trump's appearances in Houston this year, and much more. So how the panel is going to be set up is we have 10 to 12 minutes of opening remarks, three to five minutes of responses from the panelists with each other, and the whole rest of the time we can spend doing Q&A. And we have a good audience here, so we'll be able to get questions from everybody. So uh, would you like to start? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see. Like, uh, so I have some prepared uh, comments, but um, I didn't have quite enough time to kind of wrap everything up, though. So there's a lot of loose ends here. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'll start and then maybe talk through the parts so that I wasn't able to get to in the prepared comments. <clears throat> um, the 50th anniversary of 1968 has inevitably evoked parallels between our present historical moment and the monumental social and political upheavals with which the year 1968 is associated. From Saigon to Paris, from the Dead Offensive in January to the French student protest in May, from King's assassination in Memphis to the massacre in Mexico City, <clears throat> um, in the ongoing US interventions abroad, institutionalized police racism and violence at home, uh, the corruption in Washington, and we hear echoes of the war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement, and the rise of the new left in the U.S. and Europe. Um, but history, as Marx mentioned somewhere, is only repeated as farce. And, um, and so I wonder if such parallels, um, um, let me see, so, uh, like how far these parallels can actually extend those. What I wanted to do was kind of <clears throat> like start by sort of talking about um, I guess sort of differences between the 1960s and now, and I wanted to sort of, um, and so I got through to that part though, but I wasn't quite able to finish the, the sort of, um, the part sort of about the present though, so I'll, I'll just read what I have. About, um, okay, so uh, the new left emerged during a period which we've long since left behind when rising productivity rates were coupled with increasing wages and a higher standard of living. Uh, this was an anomaly in the history of capitalism, which has been characterized by what Marx called the inverse relationship between increased productivity owing to technological change and the value contained in commodities, including wage labor, right? So since exchange value is determined by labor time, technology reduces the amount of labor required for the production of goods, thereby decreasing their value. But, um, but this didn't appear to be the rule during this period. <coughs> um, the prosperity resulting from this virtuous coupling of rising productivity levels and wages uh, created a new middle class that could afford to send its children to college in the midst of a great post-war expansion in public higher education in the US and Europe. Um, together with the Higher Education Act signed in 1965, which increased access to women and minorities, this produced the conditions for the student radicalism that would define the new left. <clears throat> In the 1960s, um, yes, yeah, so in the 1960s, there were more students than farmers in the U.S., um, more students than minors, um, and the number of people enrolled in formal education um, uh, was more than the um, total number of, peop of people working in construction, transportation, and public utilities. Um, so the new left then emerged in a middle class society that appeared to transcend the tendency, <coughs> uh, characteristic of an earlier age of industrial capitalism toward greater and greater social polarization. Instead of um, increasing class conflict between workers and owners of the means of production, capitalism, the post-war period, succeeded in establishing an accord between big business and organized labor. This accord would effectively neutralize the old left as a, a force for revolutionary change. The proletariat, the proletariat happily settled in its middle class suburbs surrounded by the conveniences of a new consumer society proved perfectly willing to relinquish its role as the revolutionary subject of history. Um, yet by freeing the new left from the traditional focus on labor, this development enabled it to raise new demands for the abolition of racial, gender, and sexual oppression, while at the same time depriving it of a mass political basis. <clears throat> um, this problem was resolved in theory by the new left through its identification with the struggles for national liberation in the third world and with separatist movements at home. This identification allowed it to assert a vanguard position in spite of the absence of support from a white working class, which had apparently been absorbed into an international aristocracy of labor, 
aligned with the interests of U.S. imperialism. <clears throat> so because the class struggle had evolved into a global contradiction between colonizer and colonized, the new left, identifying itself with the, quote, uh, black and brown proletariat at home and abroad, had supposedly acquired the mantle of an international vanguard. But if this theoretical solution used to justify the absence of a mass political basis <clears throat> is what distinguished the new left from the old, it also preserves, I'd argue, a fundamental presupposition inherited from the old left's understanding of capitalism. For both the new left and the old, the contradiction that underlies capitalism is a class contradiction. Uh, so whether this, contra this conflict occurs um, between contending classes in a particular country or between an imperialist power and a worldwide proletariat, the capitalist system for both the new left and the old is based upon the exploitation of labor, and labor is understood as the source of all surplus value. <clears throat> so because the third world had become the primary site of capitalist exploitation, owing to the rise of a labor aristocracy, uh, groups like the SDS argued that the black and brown proletariat had come to embody the interests of the proletarian class as a whole. Right? So in uh, the class analysis debate in 1969, um, SDS declared its opposition to the, quote, military suppression and economic exploitation of third world countries and the internal colonies of this country. <clears throat> okay, so um, this new left critique of capitalism, however, as a system based on the exploitation of black and brown labor, I think is inconsistent with its own characterization of the specific form of oppression that defines this representative segment of the world proletariat. In uh, the class analysis debate, the condition of the lumpen proletariat is not defined um, in, the, in the document by the exploitation of labor, but rather by its exclusion from a wage labor market where income, for white workers at least, was momentarily rising together with productivity rates. The exclusion, as the SDS statement suggests, was not only um, a product of racism, and this is from the document, um, in this sector of the proletariat, um, we see the picture of this racist society the clearest, as fewer and fewer people are needed to produce what is necessary for life, for the life of the country as a whole. Black and brown youth are kept out of the higher levels of education, and then many are left in unemployment. Right? So um, I think what the logic of this statement suggests is that racism then reinforces an exclusion from work, or rather from wage labor, that arises paradoxically from increased productivity resulting from technological progress or the development of the forces of production. Um, so in a speech delivered um, at the United Automobile Workers 20th, 25th anniversary dinner in 1961, Martin Luther King described <coughs> this form of exclusion as a catastrophe that is created by progress itself. So he says, New economic patterning through automation is dissolving the jobs of workers in some of the nation's basic industries. This to me is a catastrophe. We are neither technologically advanced nor socially enlightened if we witness this disaster for tens of thousands without finding a solution. And by a solution, I mean a real and genuine alternative uh, providing the same living standards which were swept away by a force called progress but which some uh, call destruction. <coughs> So the condition that King is describing, of course, is not one that involved the exploitation of labor. Um, the condition um, of a black and brown proletariat that has become the primary source of surplus value for capitalism. On the contrary, it's precisely because the value of their work has been destroyed by technological progress that their labor cannot be exploited by the owners of the means of production. Um, so that's as far as I got, and so I... I um, I feel like sort of this, um, this sort of virtuous coupling of rising productivity um, wa uh, rates with wages, though, that um, was sort of enjoyed by um, sort of white workers during this period. <coughs> um, let's see. So that wasn't the case, it seemed like, in Martin Luther King's description of uh, the situation uh, with African Americans. Though. But I, I feel that that type of racist exclusion now that has been extended, right, um, to uh, this formerly privileged sort of white middle class, though. And so what uh, we're seeing, though, is a situation that was once exclusive to this group, though, becoming sort of, um, uh, becoming general. And then the other point that I wanted to mention was that um, 
the same sort of virtuous coupling of productivity rates and wages, though, that made possible this expansion of the college population that sort of laid the condition for student radicalism, that's also kind of dissolved, though, into um, this student debt crisis, right? Um, so I guess one question I had then is, uh, what does that mean in terms of sort of, um, you know, this alliance, though, in the 1960s that the new left tried to establish with students and workers? Um, so that's as far as I got. Um, and I have some other quotes about automation um, um, from this period that I thought were really interesting, sort of anticipating, right, the problem of kind of um, these sort of surplus populations, right, that are not exploited by capital, but sort of have been largely excluded from wage work and it becomes sort of irrelevant, right, um, to, the uh, to the capitalist economy. But I'll, I'll stop there. So. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to basically give you my history of the 60s. Um, my transformations, what I saw was significant about, about, about the times. <clears throat> and it was certainly an extraordinary time. I'm, I'm no longer uh, co-chair of the Green Party, however. Um, and um, I graduated actually from Cornell in 1963. At that time, the story on campus was that uh, there was these funny people, there were a few of them, with long hair, who were suspected of dealing drugs. <laughs> but we didn't know. Um, I had spent four years at Stanford uh, getting a PhD. Uh, along the way, um, I became aware of the war and uh, to start with just sort of which side was I on about this, you know? Um, I wasn't happy with the, with the killing of people, but the government was saying we're doing this for some purpose. There was uh, uh, teach-ins in that time where faculty would preempt some time, uh, in this case, the whole day, actually, uh, with some local faculty, some people from the uh, State Department and um, a, um, a political theorist, political scientist, whose name just escaped me. Um, and I went to that and uh, listened to both sides, and it was clear to me that the government had no case. Um, so, all right, so the government has no case, so now what? Um, before, I, before I graduated, before I left and went down to Irvine, which is down in uh, Southern California, a little bit south of Los Angeles, in a town called Laguna Beach, which is where I lived. Um, <laughs> became a drug capital of the, <laughs> of the country, and Timothy Leary uh, lived there <laughs> for a while. Um, I became a hippie defender. <laughs> um, I, I, there was a, an election on campus for student body president, and there were two guys running. One guy was from a fraternity, and he was arguing about having better food in the, uh, in the cafeteria. The other guy was actually married to, um, to, um, okay, it's escaping me again, great singer at the time. You know her. I can remember her name. Joan Baez. What's that? Joan Baez. Joan Baez. Oh. That's right. Um, and he, um, he was suggesting we probably needed to, uh, uh, think about going to jail in order to stop this war. So that was the conflict between the two sides at that time. And um, I thought, yeah, I, I think I'm with these guys. <laughs> there wasn't any, there wasn't any um, sort of in intellectual over, over, uh, overlay of this for me. I had come in as basically a liberal. Um, um, I had become frightened when I was 11 years old by the, um, uh, the execution of the uh, Rosenbergs. And I followed it in the newspapers. And I couldn't quite, was this, does this make sense? Is this okay? And uh, when I saw that they were executing a mother, they might execute my mother, I got pretty frightened and thought, I wanted to stay in the middle of things. I didn't want to be out on the edges of things where I might be picked off myself. So um, that was pretty much where I was. Uh, 
And, but there was, there was this war going on. It was clear to me it didn't make any sense. I uh, had a job as an assistant professor down at, at Irvine. Um, and uh, very quickly uh, got in touch with the anti-war groups there, of which there were many faculty. Um, uh, we worked, at, I remember working on producing uh, blue mimeograph things. <laughs> Um, you leave with your hands all blue and, um, and distributing those. And um, be began conversations with my other colleagues about what was going on here. Also, also for myself, it was like, uh, like, what the hell is going on? What am I doing here in this world? And um, what makes sense here? Um, the um, The, um, the conversation was alive amongst the faculty as well as to what was happening. And I was, I was involved in that. And it was just, you know, I couldn't see supporting this thing, but I didn't see it as imperialism. And in fact, even by the end of, uh, end of the 60s, I couldn't quite figure out what the hell we were doing this for. What was the, what was the purpose of this? Um, the, um, there was one event which uh, promoted me into sort of the, the forefront of the politics in the, on the campus locally, which was um, a fellow named Eldridge Cleaver, who was, um, was going to be eventually the uh, presidential candidate for the Peace and Freedom Party, which had had some, some role in, in bringing, uh, getting the petition signed so that they were a legitimate party in California. They still are. Uh, and uh, he was supposed to teach up at, up at Berkeley in a special, special class where the faculty had gotten permission to bring in people from the outside who were controversial, specifically for that reason, so that the students would have a chance to understand and deal with these ideas. Well, whatever he just said, uh, no, we'd, uh, we may have said that before, but not this guy. Uh, and the faculty were all up in arms, and I wrote a... Uh, uh, my first, my very first time in the, in the academic senate of the university was my second year there. I wrote a motion which said, "Is um, this this is this doesn't recognize our authority? We're not going to recognize your authority. We're not going to pay attention to what the uh, the uh, university's central campus, University of California at the time, was sort of like what the University of Houston is, but bigger. You had about nine campuses, and you had a, a central administration for that." which was located in Berkeley. And that passed. <laughs> and for a while, the young faculty on the campus, the campus was only three years old, so there were lots of young faculty there before. The young faculty and me in the middle of all of that, we actually uh, had the initiative on the, on the politics on the campus. Um, um, the students became active. Uh, the student movement also, uh, there were discussions about uh, uh, Marxism. Some people were, some people weren't. Um, uh, the uh, opposition to the war uh, got, got broader and broader. Um, as time went on, <clears throat> well, uh, that's one thing that was significant for me. I went down and I, I, I watched the discussion of the students of the issues around the war, and it was it was a, a discussion in primarily in moral terms, as well as analytical terms, but um, <coughs> I was struck with two things. One was the um, the respect of the process had for each one of each each person. And the other was the clarity of the speaking of the people who were speaking. I left feeling in love <laughs> with this student movement. And for the rest of the time that I was there, I was involved in student activities. Um, um, we did, in fact, uh, at one point, we organized a, um, a protest in Orange County. Orange County, you may know, is one of the most conservative counties in California. Um, uh, with the other faculty, mostly students in, in, in the other campuses. We got about 5,000 people out uh, on, 
other day, and I had some thoughts about what they ought to be doing. Um, but it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. The, pe the people who showed up, that was an experience, I think, that moved people along. But there wasn't an overall place you could, you could relate to. There was no party, for instance, that had a, a consensus of, of, of amongst all the people who were already active. There was no, um, there, there was no uh, unitary vision of what our society might look like after this. You know. um, the, 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 um, the last thing I want to speak to was what happened in 1970, which is when Kent State uh, the Kent State Cambodia eruption occurred. There are 400 universities were closed down in this country. Um, Richard Nixon was found wandering on the, on the, uh, in, in Washington one evening, uh, talking to people who are out there about what the hell is going on here. Uh, at our campus, we did in fact close it down for for from. The, about the fifth or sixth of May until the end of the, the end of the year, uh, we succeeded in getting all the students. <laughs> everybody got an A in all their subjects <laughs> as a result of the action in the academic senate, which I had a role in as well. But the thing I want to share with you about that that experience was um, we occupied what had been the cafeteria and the student center for all that time. And there were organizations, people went out and blocked roads, they did marches, they went to other campuses, they did all kinds of stuff. And there was, there was ongoing conversations in the, in, the bot, in the building of people who were actively engaged in this, trying to make it, keeping it going, not knowing what was gonna happen, not knowing if we're sitting on a revolution, really, but just, it was the quality of the speaking, the, the honesty and clarity that people spoke from. It was, there was no hiding. There was no, um, there, there, I don't know how to say it, but pe people were just very, very straight with who they were and what they wanted and what they cared about and what they disagreed with you about. It was an extraordinary time to be alive and to participate in that. I've never seen that happen again in any social situation. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. 50 years on, 1968 still stands as a year of intense political and social struggle in our country and also in other countries as well, as Dewey was mentioning. This year, I'd like to recall some of the most important developments of 1968, and I hope that even a brief survey will provide enough historical context so that I can address at least a couple of the questions about the old left, the new left, and the relation between the two. 1968 got off to quite a start with a massive Tet Offensive. The men and women fighting against U.S. forces and to liberate Vietnam sustained heavy losses and gained little ground. But the Tet Offensive made clear one thing. Washington could not, end, could not win that war. The next month, February, about 10,000 people participated in a massive anti-war conference at the Free University in West Berlin. It was illegal to be a communist, but more than 20,000 marched against war and capitalism, with many carrying portraits of Rosa Luxemburg, Ho Chi Minh, and Che Guevara. In March, workers and students demanded social and political reforms in Czechoslovakia and Poland. Some communist party members in both countries supported those reform struggles, though their leaders had other ideas. On April 4th, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis. My family had moved to Memphis. We'd been there for three months. Afterward, 40 people died, 2,500 were injured, and more than 20,000 were arrested in uprisings in 100 cities across this land. Two days after Dr. King died, the police in Oakland, California killed little Bobby Hutton of the Black Panther Party. He was 18. A few weeks later, SDS and the Student Afro Society occupied five buildings at Columbia University in New York. 
they were protesting the war in Vietnam and the university's complicity in imperialism and racism. As previously mentioned by Dewey in May, radical students in Paris took to the streets against the de Gaulle government, and 10 million workers took to the streets in a historic general strike. A massive student uprising and general strike also developed in Senegal. In June, more than 10,000 workers and young people marched for reforms in Yugoslavia. In Kitakyushu, Japan, anti-war activists stopped a freight train loaded with ammunition headed for Vietnam. And in LA, Robert Kennedy was shot to death by a Palestinian man outraged by his support for Israel. In August, more than 10,000 people in this country answered the call, George will remember, please come to Chicago to protest against the Democratic National Convention. The ensuing police riot resulted in numerous injuries, but the televised violence fostered greater opposition to the war, the cops, and both major political parties. That same month, Warsaw Pact troops entered Czechoslovakia and ended the reform efforts of Alexander Dubček. In September, 200 women protested against the Miss America contest in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a seminal political action for the women's liberation movement in our country. In October, more than 10,000 people protested against PRI, the so-called Institutional Revolutionary Party that governed Mexico. That protest was in Mexico City. About 300 protesters were killed by soldiers. Others were detained and tortured. In November, more than 10,000 people marched against anti-Catholic discrimination in Derry, Northern Ireland. The unionist backlash that followed led to armed sectarian conflict that went on for many years. By December 1968, protests against oppressive governments had arisen in Spain, Portugal, Greece, Pakistan, and other countries. And in China, the People's Liberation Army, which Mao had so vigorously attacked during earlier stages of the so-called Cultural Revolution, now followed his orders to suppress remaining protests. The upsurge of popular struggles continued well beyond the end of this year. 1969 witnessed the Stonewall Rebellion, the largest demonstration ever against the Vietnam War, and the assassination of Black Panthers Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. 1970 witnessed not only the massive explosion of protest on the campuses that George mentioned about Nixon's expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia, but it also witnessed the death of those four students at Kent State, as well as the giant women's strike <coughs> on Equality Day. And of course, much, much more was to come. One of the questions and the uh, prompt was, why was a new left needed? Another question was, what tasks did it inherit from the old left? I have to confess that from my vantage point, these questions may assume a fundamental or totalizing critique of existing communist or revolutionary socialist movements with which I would not at least entirely agree. I was only 13 years old in 1968, but in part because I was in Memphis when Dr. King was assassinated, I did pay attention to the injustice of racism. My mom worked all of her life. I paid attention to the mistreatment of women in the workplace and in society. I cared about the war in Vietnam. My uncle did two tours, a career soldier from rural Mississippi who came back and said that we were on the wrong side. And I also came to understand what I would later call the exploitation of workers. Some of those influences on me as a young teenager and then later helped explain why I became a communist at the age of 21 and have remained so for more than 40 years. From my vantage point, signally then as well as now, communists and revolutionary socialists have always had it right about the need to overthrow the capitalist state, to abolish capitalism, and to construct a socialist society. And I think we've always had it right about the working class being the historical agency of socialist revolution. In that sense, I have some similarities and some differences in my analysis compared to Dewey's, and maybe we can talk about that in a bit. I would certainly agree, as a almost lifelong communist, that there's a lot to criticize about 20th century socialism. But I would also say that some of the organizations and movements of the new left grievously erred in abandoning the traditional commitment to the working class 
which remained the vast majority of the population, they grievously erred in abandoning class struggle and in any notion of revolution. Such groups often turned out not to be nearly as progressive or as effective or as new as some adherents hoped. After all, Marx and Engels were criticizing middle class socialist and armchair intellectuals a long, long time ago. In contrast, of course, other organizations and movements of the new left were historically quite important and genuinely progressive. And while some of them had their own limitations, these groups definitely, unequivocally, contrib contributed in a pretty major way, I would say, to emancipatory theory, emancipatory struggles, and they also helped to bring about vital improvements in the theory and the politics of those of us on the old left, too. Do you know where the term new left came from? Often we think it originated by the early 60s in the United States. It didn't. It didn't. The label new left actually originated in the UK in the mid-1950s. The term came to refer to people who left the CP, the Communist Party of Great Britain, after the Warsaw Pact intervention in Hungary, and referred also to academics around the universities and left review, I think later known as the New Left Review, which is still around, and other left-oriented people who had begun, frankly, to despair about the potential of the working class in the advanced capitalist countries. I think one can respect people like Edward Thompson and Raymond Williams, but still disagree with the politics that eventually became mired in social democracy, itself another part of the old left. And I think that one can respect C. Wright Mills and Herbert Marcuse, both of whom popularized the term new left in our country while disagreeing with their embrace of middle class students, youth, and intellectuals as the prime movers behind progressive social change. Again, there were very different kinds of organizations with very different social bases in the new left in the United States. For example, SDS evolved from the Social Democratic League for Industrial Democracy and was chiefly composed of upper middle class and middle class white university students. I'm not talking mainly about the children of better paid workers either, but the children of lawyers, doctors, managers, and folks we would traditionally most of us define as truly middle class or upper middle class. The SDS Port Huron statement expressly focused on this constituency and largely abandoned the traditional left focus on the working class and the centrality of class struggle. Of course, I think the SDS should be credited a lot with helping to build a movement against the war in Vietnam and the movement against the draft with opposing racism and for naming the system responsible for so much alienation and inhumanity. But even the Port Huron statement was clear about their constituency. They talked about people born and raised in comfort in this country. And frankly, most people who used to work for a living were not living in comfort in 1962 or 1972 or 1982 or at any time since. It's hardly surprising that SDS had only limited success with workers and unions. Some more left-oriented organizations later had much more success in Detroit and elsewhere. And we should recall that SDS eventually splintered and different factions went their separate ways and the organization died in the late 1960s. But when that happened, some of the most fervent activists who had been in SDS embraced another section of the old left, in this case Maoism. That was popular for a while. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was deeply rooted in the African American working class and represented an important step forward in the black freedom movement, in my view. Organizing the armed self-defense of African American communities was a vital imperative at a time of widespread police murder and abuse, and existing left parties were unable to meet that need. Of course, you know the Panthers also provided free breakfast for children, lessons in African American and African history in the community, and they too came over time to embrace Maoism, another example of the old left, as it were, taking new form. Tragically, though, you know this too, state repression, extremely violent state repression, as well as grave tactical mistakes and internal political problems led to the destruction of the Panthers. <coughs> the mass civil rights movement led by Dr. King, the SCLC, and allied organizations was also deeply rooted in the working class and played a pivotal role in forcing the U.S. Congress to enact 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These historic measures did provide significant, if still limited, progress for people of African descent and also for other people of color. The Civil Rights Movement, at least the rank and file, was predominantly liberal, not socialist, you know, not revolutionary, but Dr. King was certainly a staunch critic of capitalism, and this movement also benefited from the support of communist and revolutionary socialists, again, the old left. This movement's mass disruptive civil disobedience significantly influenced the mounting struggle against the Vietnam War, and this movement had the potential to unite with other sections of the black freedom movement and help develop a popular multinational working class movement to challenge capitalism. I've always thought that that's why Malcolm was killed, that that's why Dr. King was killed, that that's why the Panther Cadres were killed or imprisoned. For me, those awful historic developments confirmed then, they confirmed now the threat posed by the capitalist state in an era of mounting mass struggle and the need for the revolutionary overthrow of that state. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, there were some other really important new beginnings for different oppressed or subaltern groups in our society. Frankly, too often in the past, communist and revolutionary socialist parties had not adequately theorized or adequately fought against the many-sided oppression of women. The women's movement helped to change a lot of that during the period. Yes, it does need to be noted, it does need to be understood that much of the women's movement at the time was upper middle class or middle class and white and much of the women's movement could hardly be described as Marxist or even anti-capitalist. Nonetheless, the subjugation they fought and the issues that they raised did raise the consciousness of vast numbers of women, including vast numbers of working class women and working class men and of communist and revolutionary socialists too. We learned a lot along the way. Similarly, although George may have a couple of years on me, I am old enough to remember a time when being identified as gay or lesbian was viewed by communists and revolutionary socialists as a sign of bourgeois decadence. Most of you don't remember that because you were here. That's really true, and it was really awful. But in the 1960s and the 70s, the new affirmation that gay is good and the vigor of the Stonewall Rebellion, it didn't instantly usher in a new era of tolerance and mutual respect, but it did help to advance the process of personal and social liberation for gays and lesbians and bisexuals, a process that advanced even more in recent years. And straight people, including communists and revolutionary socialists, have benefited a great deal from this emancipatory struggle too. Like the broad black freedom movement, like the nation Chicano movement, I think the struggles of women and the struggles of the LGBT communities are best understood not as separatist movements, but as distinct and unique struggles for liberation from distinct and unique, if interrelated, forms of oppression. I think that these movements emerged the way that they did in this country, in part because of the limited successes and limited political reach of the existing communist and revolutionary socialist parties, and in part because of some very profound inadequacies in those same parties. The civil rights reforms of the mid-60s, the emergence of the new social movements, these were not the only achievements of the 60s and 70s. Mass disruptive social protests gained a new level of popular legitimacy. Lyndon Johnson was driven from office. So was Charles de Gaulle. The U.S. invasion of Vietnam was ended. Women in the U.S. won reproductive rights. Some too limited, but definitely some attenuation of white supremacist and sexist attitudes occurred the imperative of environmental protection became popularized and public outrage over the Watergate scandal forced Richard Nixon to resign the presidency in disgrace. But by the end of the 1970s, violent repression, co-optation, the channeling of dissent into electoral channels, conservative resurgence, and other developments had combined to end the historic social upheavals. As a result, in the decades since then, the masses in this country, and in other countries too, have continued to suffer in the absence of a mass, multinational, working class-led movement 
to bring about socialist revolution. In my view, the development of such a movement remains our most important challenge today, as it has been for more than a century. But let me conclude on an optimistic note. I am ever the optimist. I do believe that in the years ahead, the continuing globalization of capitalism, the mounting race to the bottom, the end of the American dream for almost all workers, the mounting rejection of bourgeois politics, the danger posed by the far right in fascism, and the renewal of socialist and other liberatory aspirations will help growing numbers of people understand that our choice remains as stark and as simple as Rosa Luxemburg explained in 1915, we must have a transition to socialism or we will regress into barbarism. Okay, so now we're just going to have um, some brief three to five minute responses of what um, each of the panelists said in each other's <coughs> opening remarks, and then we'll go to the Q&A for the rest of the time. So if you want to just give some thoughts. Mm -hmm. I have any responses. Um, I mean, I do disagree about the proletariat as a subject of history, but I mean, I, I don't know if I. Um, maybe that can come out as we what do you continue. Um, I, uh, so I do have a really different interpretation of Marxism. Like, I, I do think that the problem um, that the new left inherits from the old left is that sort of it maintains this kind of notion that this class contradiction between workers and capitalists, though, is the fundamental contradiction in capitalism. And I think um, since the 60s, with like this kind of decoupling I was talking about of um, you know, um, this link between rising wages and rising productivity rates, right? Like what you're seeing actually is sort of um, this deeper contradiction in play within capitalism. And that's the contradiction um, where sort of technology sort of continually sort of like um, reduces um, the value of goods reduces wages and so forth, though, and that produces not this sort of class polarization so much as sort of increasing expulsion and exclusion of people from wage labor, which we were already seeing in the 1960s, though, in in sort of um, in sort of minority communities and so forth. Um, so I think that um, that's different from the kind of contradiction that the the new left is still kind of uh, was still maintaining from from the old left. Yeah. Can I join issue? Sure, sure. Yeah. If it's okay. I think it is possible to give full weight to the different forms of oppression, uh, whether it's white supremacy or misogyny or anti-LGBT bigotry or anti-immigrant hatred. Um, I think it's possible to recognize that people who are victimized by these other forms of oppression are in fact subjects, they're living human beings, and they're subjects very, very often of resistance, sometimes accommodation, but often resistance, and in the best case circumstances of rebellion and trying to re actually revolt against those forms of oppression. But if we ask what makes capitalism capitalism, I would submit to you it remains the exploitation of workers. Um, when we talk about the rising productivity and wages of the post-World War II years, Let's be clear that yes, there was some rising productivity and there were some rising wages. But this did not mean that white workers were no longer oppressed. I think all of you recognize that workers of color remained super exploited then as they do today. But union membership never got any place past 35%. And while industrial workers did better in the post war years up through about 1973, vast numbers of workers had not moved into middle class prosperity. They had moved from poverty to what I tell my students is basically economic insecurity. You're not starving and you're able to make rent. On the other hand, it's not like you live in comfort and so forth. This whole notion of there being what some other scholars not do, we would call the golden age of capitalism, I always ask that question, for whom? And I would submit to you it wasn't for most workers, it wasn't for most white workers certainly wasn't for the working class communities in which I grew up, but it wasn't in working class communities in which comrades of mine over the decades grew up either. And if you look at what's happened since 1973, I think virtually everybody, including all sorts of bourgeois economists, would agree about wage stagnation, actual relative wage decline, and so forth. And actually, I would submit to you what you have today 
is not only vastly growing economic inequality, the sort that Bernie Sanders became famous for pointing out, and rightly so as far as it goes, but a certain kind of class polarization. And if there are difficulties in sort of you know, seeing that for, for me or for anybody else, uh, it's good to remember that this isn't the only thing going on. If you look at the Trump campaign, if you look at the horrific evolution of the Republican Party since 1968 and Nixon's Southern strategy, you see an effort to roll back the gains made by people of color since 1968, since like right after some of the initial successes, the same way that you see later efforts to dismantle the great society programs that benefited workers from all backgrounds, and now today you see efforts to roll back the New Deal and so forth. So I see today, not just in Trump, but in the fascist in the streets right behind him and others who sort of straddle the fence, a kind of class polarization, certainly resurgent white supremacy and you know virulent misogyny and so forth. But I don't think that whether we're talking about the post-war period or whether we're talking about the period since 1973, I don't think that we can rightly reach the conclusion that most workers aren't exploited and as such, they don't have an objective historical interest in doing away with their exploitation. Um, sir, sir. I just want to see, George, if you wanted to also respond to anything that anyone else. Uh, well, I, 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 um, hmm. I just want to share a few more things that, that, that happened that I thought were really significant. Um, uh, and, and they're broad, broadly relevant to the, to the sort of theoretical conversations going on. There, there was a period when uh, women met uh, uh, just women in small groups of a half a dozen people in consciousness raising groups, they were called. Um, it was the most profound change that I saw happen in that whole period it was the relationships between men and women that were <laughs> created by that movement at that time. And it wasn't the consciousness raising in the area we, we were at. It lasted for about two months at the most. Uh, huge difference. A lot of a lot of relationships broke up. Women doing different things um, changed my life and my relationship altogether. Um, the other is the the relationship between um, the the student movements and the la and the labor movements. Um, where we were, there was pretty much nothing. Uh, there was no relationship. And in fact, I remember uh, a march in in New York. Uh, I forget which year it was at, but it was, it was around 68 or 69, um, where people wore hard hats and walked out and, and we were in favor of this war. Uh, and uh, that's the way it was. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say, though, is it's that the, 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 the music of the times uh, was very much integrated into the political movements. <laughs> The Beatles would publish. The Beatles would put out a record, and it would be discussed as to what, what the significance of this was. And they weren't the only ones. Uh, and it was a great thing about that. The sort of the, the, the culture, the the, the the liberation culture was generating its own music, its own its own um, um, uh, styles of interacting, and that was critical. It was critical for me. It was, it was seeing people behaving differently around me. Mm, I think I might like to try that. I think I might like to state that, state that kind of radical position and, and that kind of way of arguing with people. Um, so so I, I, think, I think somehow it's very important to understand the way that these things happen, um, maybe person by person, as, as things propagate. Right, so for the now the Q and A portion, do we have any questions, or I will start off? Yes, sir. So, uh, and for the interesting panels, I'm actually very sympathetic to your argument. <coughs> sorry, I missed your name. Do it was when? When? Sorry. Yeah. About there like being this fundamental. Speak up. Sorry, about yeah. being this fundamental <coughs> parts of people who are excluded. Yeah. I come from a place that had 65 percent youth unemployment when I left. It. Yeah. Right. So what is you know, the U.S. we may not feel it, but I come from the peripheries of the world where you actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I understand why you. The, sorry, your name. <laughs> you raised the objection that okay, proletarians are still exploited, but for right. those of us who were excluded, mm -hmm. I feel we have no way of fighting back, right? Because proletarians can withdraw their labor. Yeah. If you're completely excluded from the means of production right. or even the gain. 
you just have to basically sit down and wait for universal basic income or right. something like that because you have no power to right. change things. And I was wondering if you had any Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not denying the existence of the exploitation of labor, but I think this phenomenon of, of exclusion you could sort of like see already in the 1960s and from before as well, though, has become sort of increasingly predominant. And it's a really different situation, though, from sort of exploitation, though, where basically, like, your labor is not even good enough to be exploited. And so, and it characterizes increasingly sort of groups like refugees that can't sort of um, base their claim of inclusion on sort of labor, right? Um, and, um, yeah, so as the capitalist system is producing more and more of this sort of expulsion of people, though, who aren't even good enough to be able to be integrated into their wage system, um, there's a different type of oppression. I mean, you can see this... Um, in the case of the Palestinians, though, um, where after the Oslo Accords, you had this huge sort of influx, though, of Soviet, Ju um, no, sort of um, labor, though, from other countries that basically made huge portions of the Palestinian population sort of like irrelevant to the Israeli economy. And at that point, it became really dangerous for them, though, because they no longer um, needed that population to exploit for their labor, so they could just sort of wall them off completely. And that's become more and more of a phenomenon. Um, and this was something that was raised by a lot of radical groups in the 60s, too, though. I think sort of that's one of the legacies of the new left you could still take. But um, So I'm not denying the existence of exploitation, though, but I think especially now um, you're starting to see sort of um, um, this problem that I think was partially covered over uh, in the U.S., at least. Uh, if I can jump right yeah. back in. I appreciate you making reference to the Palestinians. It's yeah. like if you talk about gross injustices in the world, hard to beat that as an example, right? As far, I mean, I just have a little bit different analysis, but let me respond on the issue of immigration. If you think about it for a second, sometimes people react to Trump and the far right, these open in your face racists and anti immigrant people saying, oh, they're trying to make America white again. Clearly they are, but it means something a little bit more than we might think, and in a way it's sort of even scary. It's all scary. You know, this society could not survive for a day, not for a 24-hour period, without the maintenance of, the preservation of, immigrant labor. And so while Trump certainly fears changing demographics, the browning of America, no doubt about that, and folks behind him perhaps even more, you know, he won't live to see some of the results. The fact of the matter is that I don't believe, in my view, that Trump is not trying to get rid of all the immigrants. What he's trying to do is get rid of some immigrants, but enough to basically make remaining immigrant labor, on which this country will continue to depend, insecure, frightened, willing to work for lower wages, afraid to form unions or afraid to fight back in the workplace, and to give up all hope of becoming citizens and voting and having some kind of at least nominal share in power. So in that sense, I see that more as continuing and escalating exploitation or super exploitation not real exclusion, because frankly, this society could not, as I said, for a day without immigrant labor. And so I think when we think about Trump wanting to make America not great again, but white again, he's looking for a resurgence and a renewed defense of white supremacy, but that doesn't mean that they can afford an all-white population. Somebody's got to do the dirty work. If I can respond real quick to that, like, I, I thought that sort of the... Uh um, the, what was interesting about the political discourse during the campaign, right, was, um, you know, Trump could sort of mobilize this sort of um, discourse of outsourcing labor and so forth, though. And no one was talking about, at that point at least, though, about the fact that most of the labor was disappearing because of automation, though, and they're not coming back. Um, so that's, I think this is linked up to the question about sort of exploitation versus expulsion. I mean, they're not coming back not because... Um, you know, we need sort of more immigrants. I don't know, yeah. I mean, I, I just think that's that, a really that, good that, point. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes people <coughs> think that all the jobs are disappearing because right. of outsourcing, right. and people who know more about this than I, as a lot of people, uh, including some bourgeois economists, would say the automation is really even more central. So yes. I, you know, I think that that's right. But if you think about it, not just in terms of present trends, but if you think about unmet needs of the people, and shouldn't labor be about meeting the needs of people, transforming nature to meet human needs and so forth? It's definitely true that automation threatens even more jobs in the future. I mean, I've read some stuff, even from the McKinsey people, it's pretty frightening about that. But if you think about it, just for one, ex just one example, massive infrastructure, construction, rehab, and repair, you're not going to be able to get robots to do that. That requires real-life human <coughs> labor. You know, there are other examples, too. I mean, I know there's a big trend in the universities and colleges to promote distance education. Often there's more distance and less education, in my view, and so forth. But there's no, but there's no real substitute for 
people teaching face-to-face -face classes you know in many many circumstances same thing if you think about the provision of health care no matter how much new technology you incorporate and so forth you got to have not just doctors you know really bad nurses and all sorts of other technicians and so forth so you know I don't think we should see automation I'm not saying you do do it but I don't think we see automation as some kind of Leviathan that just moves on, on its own Automation ha plays the role that it does, not because well, of some inexorable technological imperative, yeah, yeah, but yeah. because this occurs. Who's making the decisions? Capitalists and their managers. Imagine a world, imagine a country run by workers. Well, I mean, uh, like this contradiction that I was getting at, though, uh, that I think King is sort of touching on, and that, uh, and that I want to distinguish from a class contradiction, right, is one in which technological um, development, right, which sort of like relieves people or liberates people from labor in a society that's based upon wage labor sort of destroys jobs, right? So instead of having, you know, the very thing that produces the condition for a liberated society ends up leading to catastrophe instead. And so that's not purely a technological development. It's bound up, though, with a historically determinate sort of system of like where you get paid um, to labor. And, um, and actually, you know, like I do a lot of... Um, look into sort of like the history of capitalism in Vietnam too though, that wasn't there before either. Um, actually the communists helped to sort of install that system through collectivization though where they basically made everyone work for the state though by expropriating their land though and having that become collectivized. So that was a way of kind of imposing this wage system that hadn't existed before. But yeah, but, but yeah, so it's not, it's not a purely automated um, process, you know, like this, this technological development that was spurred on and sort of is affected, um, affects sort of this wage system that then just, you know, yeah. Sorry, uh, just I want to go back to, the, do we have a question or I'll ask a question? I'll take, I'll abuse my moderator privilege and ask a question. Um, because I wanted to kind of link in um, <coughs> all of the opening remarks. Um, you had mentioned that the new left seemed to update something from the old left. Yeah. With this kind of theory of exploitation. And David, you also mentioned the new left returning to the old left sort of at the end of Sometimes folks like in the SDS ended up being Maoist. Right. The Black Panther Party moved toward Maoism, became recognizably mm -hmm. Maoist. Some other forces did as well. Others, like the Communist Party USA, old left as anybody else, and same with the SWP at the time, they recruited entire new generations of activists, which sometimes people don't realize. I see. And um, uh, George, you had also mentioned in 1970, I guess, at some protests, I guess, Maybe I'm reading this too much, but a kind of ambivalence about where is this going or what way forward, or do we have a um, kind of party? But yeah, yeah, that was true. Uh, the the, um, the Kent State Cambodia uprising uh -huh. was the end of the '60s, as far as I could tell. Uh, the um, and at that during that period of time, we the people who were engaged in it really didn't know right. what was going to happen. We didn't know whether, for instance, the working class was somehow going to support us. There wasn't any, actually, there weren't any linkages. It didn't happen. Um, but we just didn't know. I mean, and there was, uh, and so there was all that uncertainty about what what could happen next. Um, so my, my question then is, I was wondering if each of the panelists could talk to the difference between the early 60s versus the late 60s. Because there's sort of a, a question over, you know, does the late 60s discover something that wasn't there in the early 60s, you know, new kinds of liberation movements, or do they actually even fall back on something, on an older problem, as you were mentioning, Dewey, that is updated, it's like passed down and gets a new garb or something. Um, or do they actually advance on the old left in some way, and this is what's happening at then? So I guess my question is, how did the 60s play out then? Is it progress? Is it regress? Did the later 60s advance on the new, on the early part? In what way? And whoever wants to, to take a crack at that question. <laughs> take the SDS. Take him someplace. No. In 1962, you have the Port Huron Statement. Okay. And it's, forgive the technical language here, but it's those petty bourgeois statements you never want to see. I mean, on the one hand, it reminds us of Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. You know, on the other hand, most workers in this country, of all nationalities, of all backgrounds, were not living in comfort, like I mentioned before, and were facing more than just alienation and estrangement and inhumanity. 
people were struggling to eat, to pay rent, to take care of their children. Most working class folks could not send their kids to college. That took for years after the HEA was uh, passed in 1965. So, but anyway, it seems to me over time, to give the SDS credit, that as they got more and more involved in political struggle, they came to a better understanding about the monster they faced in this country of capitalism and imperialism and white supremacy. And I think that they got, if you'll forgive the pun, radicalized. That was good. Now the part about deciding Mao more than ever, you know, that I have some, you know, principal political disagreements with and so forth. You know, and then there were other folks that decided eventually they could, since workers were not all coming out to instantly join the revolution, some folks thought we can jumpstart the revolution by bombing here and bombing there. And, you know, I tell you that Lenin was the really best critic about that kind of, what you might call, individual terrorism. It's no substitute for mo mobilizing the masses of people and stuff. But uh, we live today, even now, and there are you know, comrades and brothers and sisters in Houston, comrade in the ecumenical sense, in the spirit of the occasion, a what George was saying, who owe their political legacy or lineage to being in the SDS at one point and then being in one of the splinter groups and then perhaps in the Revolutionary Union, not to name names and so forth and so on, right? And so I have a really high regard, as much as I disagree with Maoism, I have a really high regard for people that came into the struggle, sort of found that they really were facing a monster that would require really serious means, you know, to struggle against it and embrace, you know, at least some kind of revolutionary alternative and so forth. You know, I think similarly, um, Dr. King himself, you know, he had had anti-capitalist views since he was in seminary school and so forth. But you know, I think the tactical interest of the civil rights movement required a certain kind of focus on dismantling public segregation required by law and getting some voting rights in the South, and of course the Southwest. But certainly by 1967, with the war in Vietnam raging, you know, he was principled enough and courageous enough to come out and say, you know, the greatest <coughs> purveyor of violence in the world today is, is the U.S. government, my own government, and this stuff in Vietnam has got to stop. That was an incredibly big step for him publicly because there were a lot of other black ministers and folks who said, no, nah, you can't do that. Politicians like LBJ were very, very upset. People who supported the war were very, very upset. But he sort of came to realize we're going to have to just bring this out. We've got to fight against not only something he always felt, but we have to fight against racism to be sure. We've got to keep up that. But we have to fight against poverty no matter where you find it in the working class, in the population. You've got to fight against militarism. And he called for the radical restructuring of our society, a revolution of values. And he had his own criticisms of traditional Marxism-Leninism. He had his own criticisms of capitalism. And even though he didn't live long enough to be able to sort of like theorize that from a position of leisure and some time off, much less help to build the poor people's movement that he really wanted to see, you know, I think it's fair to say that, you know, he got radicalized. And then he got killed. He got killed, which is instructive. Just a couple of examples. Well, for, for myself, and I think for many of the people around me, um, the beginning of the 60s, the society looked like it was frozen. You could fit into it, but that's the choice. You would try to find some way to fit into it. It was solid and stable, and that was the way it was going to be. Um, over the course of the 60s, the understanding that the society was constantly in change, that there was a dynamical thing happening here all the time, um, and... Um, that you could be an agent in that, um, I, I think became, that sort of understanding became widely accepted by large numbers of people who were engaged, at least where I saw them in the student movement, for instance, um, and the possibility of a revolution. You know, the, the, uh, about a year after I, after I came down, two years after I came down to and we started talking about it amongst faculty. We need a revolution. <laughs> um, oh yeah, okay, great, we'll do that. Uh, well, just how you do that is not so clear, but how it happens is not so clear. But, um, but, but that was a big change from the way it was going in, for sure. The sense of possibility, the sense of the dynamism of things. Um, yeah, it was, it was very different at the end. And, 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 and there was a repression after that as well, which sort of people sort of went into hiding. You know, I, I, uh, yeah. the, the, the dominant factor on, on the campus uh, the year after 
uh, <coughs> state Cambodia uprising was the uh, the Jesus freaks. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to kind of develop in my comments that sort of related to this question is, um, <clears throat> is um, so this whole notion that um, the contradiction sort of uh, between workers and capitalists has shifted to this sort of global contradiction between colonizer and colonized. Um, that always seems strange to me because I, I feel like in the history books, though, it's pretty much a consensus now that there is like very little strategic and economic importance um, that the Vietnam had very little sort of economic and strategic importance for the U.S., right? It was, um, yeah, and so I just, um, it, it seems funny that if, if, if that war was really about this contradiction that supposedly um, was so basic to the capitalist system, then why was that war? Why were the stakes sort of so low? Well, you know, there were more spectacular stakes, I, I, I think, though, than, uh, than sort of real economic and strategic ones. Um, but, yeah, so... I could hazard an answer to that. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, just brief, because I, I saw a few hands up. Oh, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I mean, you can... Okay. Uh, Fleet, you want to answer? No, 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 no. Do we okay, ask a good add, question? I just add sort of like, and it was such an important symbol for the new left during that period, though, like globally, too. And yet, sort of, how was it that it was, you know, like something that seemed so insignificant, you know? Uh, the answer thing, to yeah. that question was posed by Harry Magdoff in 1969 in the Age of Imperialism and by lots of other scholars whose names I can't possibly remember. It's not like Vietnam or any other single country dominated by imperialist French or US or British or whatever. Anyone made all the difference in the world to the accumulation of capital back at home. But I mean, we know from documents from the State Department and US <laughs> politicians from the 50s that basically the United States hoped to use the rice and tin and rubber from Vietnam to support our new vassal state in Japan. Beyond that, you've heard the domino theory. Watch out, if one country decides to embrace a non-capitalist path of development, they all will. And what Harry Magdoff pointed out was that the goal of the imperialist, you know, forever, but especially after 1945, was to keep as much of the planet open for capitalist penetration as possible. You lose Vietnam, well, remember, they divided Vietnam, you know, created two countries out of one, like they did in Korea previously in 1945. But if you lose one country or, or your piece of the capitalist, I'd say the imperialist piece, as opposed to the colonizer's piece, um, you lose one piece of a country, you got the other one. You lose country, one country, you can't do, you can't lose another country. This domino theory, I grew up hearing this stuff, I and mean, I'm old enough to remember, it's like, that's really disgusting and so forth. It's like, Whose countries are these? Whose dominoes are these? And who gets to make that decision? You know, for the United States government, and this goes back before Johnson, before to Eisenhower, it's like, why weren't the elections allowed in Vietnam? In, what was it, 1954, 1956? Because the CIA told the U.S. administration 80% of the people of all of Vietnam would vote for Ho Chi Minh and the communists. So who needs elections, right? Who needs the people of Vietnam to be able to determine democratically their own destiny? So, I mean, it's not like any single country, whether it's Vietnam or whether it was Algeria for the French, definitely was going to make, make or break situation for the imperialists at home. But that broader goal of keeping as much of the world open for penetration, for exploitation, for oppression as possible, I think that's the short answer. But the other thing I've been thinking about a lot, though, in, in um, like the work that I do in Vietnam is that, like, uh, so in 1975, right, when all these northern troops go into Saigon, right, um, they they had this sort of image of the city as this enslaved population, you know, um, you know, like with their um, with their labor exploited and so forth, though. And a lot of them were just completely shocked to come in and see this sort of uh, totally modern city with all of this consumer culture uh, being littered, though, as everyone sort of was trying to escape, though. Um, so much so that the Communist Party had to sort of uh, look, uh, to remind people this was all artificial. The Americans had dumped all this money in, though, just to give you the appearance of wealth and so forth. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, but um, but yeah. So like, it was almost as if they had to kind of strain this theory of imperialism to be able to to accommodate what the Americans had sort of like um, established in South Vietnam temporarily, right? But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, a question I have is talking to kind of anybody who lived through the 60s, and there's also just a general, I think, sense of this, 
is that, uh, like you've mentioned, this, this is at the popular music of the time. So there's a cultural, um, there's a, cult, a big cultural thing happening. So the politics is tied to the culture in this way. So like everybody kind of wants in. I was talking to a, a family friend just last night, you know, talking about this panel, and you know, I was thinking about like questions that I might want to ask. And she just said, you know, and my dad echoed this as well. My dad was born in 1948. Um, and uh, this idea of like wanting to be part of it, one. Um, and so there's a cultural draw, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And I think there's also a cultural draw to politics today. So being kind of, um, so being, so it becomes like, in a small way, it can be like your community. You have a radical community, your friends are radical, et cetera. And then in a big way, it can be also this, this larger cultural thing. So it's not just your immediate friends and community. It's a sense of a big movement. Um, so I guess I'm thinking about that today, you know? So I went to a small liberal arts school where it's a very, cult politics is very cultural, you know, like the events you go to, um, your social life, um, how you talk and how you just move through your social life. It's very tied to politics um, and like who your friends are and if, if this doesn't make any sense. And also thinking about in the 60s, um, how, how there was this cultural draw. So if, is that, if that's making any sense, I guess what I'm wondering is what you guys think are the, this is directed to anybody who wants to answer what the implications are of that. If that's desirable, because you get a lot of people coming in, right? A lot of people were really interested in, uh, in being part of it, this political thing. Uh, and, or maybe is it undesirable? Are things vulgarized? Is, is, uh, is something lost there? Or is there just potential there? Or, or yeah, I guess, what are the implications of that? Both positive and negative, or maybe just positive, or maybe just negative. And, and maybe was that a new thing in the in the time? That's my question. Maybe it's a terrible question. It's a good question. Actually, my question for you would be to say more about the the political culture of, of the times and the, and the draw of that because I don't see it. I, I thought say, say it's not there. It's just that I'm not always uh, today. Saying. Yeah, today. Right. What do you see happening? What's going on? I see. Um, I guess, I don't know, I see a lot of different things. It would be easy for me to say just one thing to everybody. Because in my immediate circles, I guess it was everybody is an anti-capitalist, generally, or an anarchist or a Marxist. And all of these things are kind of grouped into one thing, being opposed to capitalism. And having a, a certain set of the correct ideas, being opposed to the police and capitalism, and you know, white supremacy, all these things. These are, these are the important positions to have. But I think that there's a lot... I think, but maybe I guess the commonality between my immediate social circle of like radical people versus the whole political spectrum of the left is that there are, there's, it's like being a leftist has like, you have these sets of ideas that are acceptable, if that makes sense. Like you're, you're pro, you're, you know, you're pro, you're feminist, you're anti racist, you're all these things. So, um, it, I think a lot of people a, like, like, all, like Hillary Clinton supporters. Right. They're all going to say I'm anti-racist. I'm you know not transphobic. I'm feminist, etc. That the same stuff they're going to say. Uh, the same stuff is like an anarchist. Although an anarchist is going to say Hillary. Maybe not exactly. The same but I, I I cut. No, but but it's the same like general positions. That's the commonality. But I'm sorry, I cut well, you off. I think a lot of people have said that you know turning politics into culture, um, like has made it really easy to kind of commodify. Um, that period, though, and to caricature it too, and um, yeah, you know, so you go to California now, sort of like the farm to table movement was started by you know in the 1960s though by people related to these radical movements too though it's all become like um, yeah, it, it, maybe turning politics into culture in that way has made it easier just to kind of dismiss it as well though to caricature it. Right? But, but, um, but it's a double-edged sword for sure. Yeah. So. Well, how is it double-edged sword? Because of the the appeal that you uh, described, right? It's got that appeal to a certain group of people, and then at the same time, because it's so stylized, right, that uh, it can be easily sort of commodified too. Another way of looking at it is that, um, although it pains me to admit this, you know, we don't have a mass movement for revolutionary change today. 
we don't have the kind of large scale consistent mass movement for the advance of women's rights or advances against police brutality and murders or to you know wipe out white supremacy we don't have those kinds of mass movements and in the absence of those movements in a you know, this stuff going on is good and it's positive, we should support. But in the absence of, you know, certain kinds of uh, peaks of political struggle, um, it can't be entirely surprising that people that share some of the same ideas are going to find other ways to express certain values they have that we can all feel good about and we share, but that are not rooted in day to day work, political work. I mean, political work is called political work for a reason because it's work. So on top of your day job, or on top of school, or on both on top of both your day job and school, on top of your family life and your family responsibilities and everything else, it's work, and you're confronting power. And in this country, like some others, you take risks when you do that, and so forth. And so, since you've had a, a diminution of the mass struggles for the most part um, over the last several decades, it's not entirely surprising that you'll find certain cultural expressions of some of the same norms and values that we can all agree to esteem, and yet many of the folks who are comfortable doing that, even if they're not just trying to commodify the culture for profit, which sometimes they are, but even if they're not doing that, you know, it's easier to, you know, engage in, you know, certain other kinds of cultural expression or to signal your views and norms and values mm -hmm. rather than spend 20 hours a week fighting the establishment, organizing protests planning to go sit in at the HPD office until they stop killing people of color, stuff like that. But I feel like the appeal of that type of culture, too, is sort of waning. Um, and in part, it has to do with sort of um, the student debt crisis. You know, like, um, I don't think we're in this sort of middle class society anymore that where people are just kind of willing to kind of get a general education and learn about stuff. But now it's because of that, though, you have like, um, I don't know, a much more sort of instrumental view of higher education, though. Um, so I think that's pretty relevant in terms of kind of, um, you know, I mean, like, um, all of, um, you know, in large part, the expanding university system during uh, this post-war period, though, like, prepared the basis, right, for a lot of the student radicalism. And now that that's sort of, I mean, it's expanded, right, but everyone's in debt now to be able to get into, and it's a really different culture in the, in, on the campuses now. So. I have a follow-up. But if other people have questions. Can I just see the hands of everybody up to so I wanna so can we go to you wanna go first round since you haven't asked the question yet? Sure. Um so I, I wanted to go back to this question of uh the exclusion of uh what what would traditionally be considered sections of the working class. Um because I I mean I think it's an interesting one and one that was was being wrestled with by the left in the sixties and what it said about kind of the historical uh Role of the working class, and I guess I really have two two questions about this. One kind of for that historical period, and then a more contemporary question. So, for that kind of historical period of uh, the late '60s, early '70s, we do see in a couple of uh, you know industrialized Western countries, you know France in May '68, Portugal in '73, that both had significant portions of the population that you might consider to be excluded from the traditional labor force. Uh, nonetheless, these uh, kind of pre-revolutionary or perhaps revolutionary uh, moments largely on the basis of the industrial working class uh, kind of in <coughs> tandem with student movements uh, and movements of um, those kind of excluded from the, the working class. And I wonder what that you know, kind of tells us about um, this, uh, this idea of the, you know, role of the working class and the exclusion of, uh, of some sections of the working class from the labor market. And then my other question is, um, I guess we kind of broaden this a little bit and look at, it seems to me that there's been, uh, at least since the mid-70s, kind of this increasing proletarianization of sections of the middle class and the petite bourgeoisie, um, and the changing relationship uh, of those kind of traditional, kind of professional or petite bourgeois classes, their relationship to uh, capital and the nature of their exploitation, uh, and I wonder kind of what, how you think that factors in. So just to try to summarize those two questions, the first one was about the relationship between 
the working class and the excluded in these two revolutions, 1968 and Portugal. Right. And then the second one is in the proletarianization of sort of the middle class of those 70s. Um, um, I think I I think I could only speak to the second part or the second question. Um, um, I think Moshe Pistone mentioned this recently, right? You know, so the opioid crisis and stuff like that. The map really maps on to sort of places, of course, where there's no jobs where people have been excluded, though, from the labor force, right? Um, so it's kind of um, it's kind of crazy, you know. The capital, um, you know, sort of destroys jobs and sends dr like sort of drugs in to sort of euthanize people and stuff, or you know, euthanize that surplus part of the population. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, like that's in some way like was a phenomenon that was already anticipated and stuff like that with the crack, that, uh, with the crack epidemic, right? Which wasn't called an epidemic because um, it didn't play, uh, like take place across sort of uh, formerly sort of white middle class areas, right? Um, but now it's a crisis, though. Um, but I'm not sure if I know um, how to respond to the first question. If I can say something about the second question too, and then I'll come back and say something about the first. When we think about proletarianization of uh, folks you used to think about as uh, middle class people, I think about professors in universities and colleges. It's like, at one level, you see the vast adjunctivization of university instruction. It's like, wow, that's pretty, pretty messed up. But it's been with us for a while, it's accelerating, and it's a huge problem, so forth and so on. I think that there are other quote, professions where you see that too, but I really appreciate the point that was made. Um, in terms of what could have been pre-revolution, I'm not sure they actually were, but I think they're close enough for to call possible pre-revolutionary situations in France and Portugal. I don't know so much about the composition, uh, the degree of composition of those forces in the streets and in the factories who are excluded from uh, participation. I know they're certainly industrial workers or other workers um, you know, to be honest, by way of self-criticism, when I ask why didn't things go better than they should have, I don't simply blame the CP of Portugal, the Saint CP of France. It's like, you know, the mother load of the social, actually existing socialist countries in this large part. The Soviet Union, on the one hand, they wanted to see developments in the West. On the other hand, they were scared to death that they would be blamed for any kind of revolutionary upsurge. If you ask me, there can never be a justification for restraining revolutionary upsurges. So I look for more of a political explanation about some of the vicissitudes and some of the really messed up things that happened in both places. When I was much younger, I wondered, could it have really happened in France? I know more about that. When you've got 10 million workers involved in a general strike, I call that a good beginning and so forth. And yet that opportunity was like there were other opportunities lost too, like after World War II, and not just in France, but in Italy and so forth. Uh, I could go on and so forth. But that's sort of the type, I'd have a more of a political analysis about that. And some, you know, merited self-criticism for the old left there, too. George, did you want to say anything to any of the questions? Um, let him ask his question again, because I, I sort of want to relate to something that you said. Ask your other question that you had. Or ask other people that. Oh, okay. I do have another question. Uh, actually, can... Can we go to you first, and then we'll come back to Flix on it, since I've seen your hand rising first. Yeah. I think you were raising some interesting points before in the sense that university education gave people some tools, and like today we really don't give people any tools. It seems like the bourgeoisie or the rulers learned way more from the 60s than we did, because you can just read the, you know, Noam Chomsky's uh, manufacturing consent and how the, the Say the protests against Iraq were massive, but the protests against Libya or Syria are basically non-existent, right? And that also speaks to how many workers in Europe are just turning to right parties that are the only ones that are beginning to question some things. And but it also opens another thing: is that meritocracy is only really questioned by feminist and anti-racist movements because they know much better than others that. Merit, meritocracy is a lie, right? And that's why you see such massive women's movements in Europe or such massive Black Lives Matter movements here, because they're the only ones that are aware that, that you know, this system is not working for them. And like, how do you actually communicate to, let's say, more traditional elements that have completely lost this political background and, and are just turning to white supremacy? 
if you do not have a viable revolutionary party and movement, you're going to get results like we see. And so I think it's always possible to perhaps overstate the importance of a, a, a party, including a revolutionary party. But if we ask, has this occurred in a vacuum? Have we gone backwards in certain important ways, or at least failed to move forward in certain important ways? The relative weakness of the left in this country, and not just in this country either, but if you think about it, uh, the fate of the CP in France and Italy and so forth, I mean, by the time they were professing Euro-communism from a revolutionary vantage point, you know, this is not right at all. And we live today with the results. So I think that you have to, those of us that believe in abolishing capitalism, we have to try to rebuild new parties and new movements. If we don't, at least some of the folks in the working class will follow the very frightened and frenzied petit bourgeois into the ranks of the far right. And we know how that ends up. Yeah, I, 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 yes. Oh, uh, yeah, I was gonna ask. Uh, I guess back in the '60s, uh, race, gender, sexuality were seen as vehicles for change, and maybe you guys see it still today. But uh, my question is, what do you see? I guess what do you see as the vehicles for change today? I only ask this question because I feel like race, gender, and sexuality have just become common sense now. That I know, even even among like Trump supporters. Like no one will. I mean, I'm sure some of them will. But like, no one will actively say that I'm, I'm against. I'm against women. I'm against black people. They, they've all like adopted the. That they they also like use their. They also use their own like. Uh, uh, I guess you you you'll find but like, on the right like you'll find all these identities on the right like. Uh, 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 immigrants against immigration and black people against. Uh, you know like. All that stuff. Yeah, let me speak to that. Um, <clears throat> so, so my sense is that the left that I've been experiencing is um, um, has has um, cultural problems having to do with people needing to have their way of seeing things, their way of moving forward, that be adopted by other people. Um, I, I think um, much of, I, I think we need to get past that. I think we have to be honest with the, the lack of understanding we have of how to do this, how to create the world we want. Um, I became a Marxist during the 60s and a communist um, and thought about it a lot. Um, I still see it, it, the, broad, the broad takes of Marxism is correct. I mean, we just have, we just have, we just have Trump. Um, he, he wants to negotiate with Latin America so that they won't, they won't ban these, these uh, fast foods uh, that are creating uh, problems of people being overweight because the companies in this country are, you know, telling him not to do that. Uh, and so, you know, it's all very clear. On the other hand, it's been clear for a long time. And um, what I see happening in terms of change is, is not really planable. It's not really foreseeable. The, 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 the collapse of the Soviet Union, for instance, wasn't, wasn't ex expected by the CIA. <coughs> Um, the the the, um, the occupation, right? But all of a sudden, what happened in New York when all, all of the, the Black Lives Matter? There are these avalanches that occur, with the tensions in the culture somehow for a while until they until they reach their end. And and um, I expect that's the way it's going to keep on happening. My sense is the place to go is we need to take better care of the children. We need to see to it that children are treated without the kind of adultism and disrespect which is genuine throughout our whole culture. Some of it shows up in hitting children. About 80% of the people in this country think a good spanking every now and then is a good thing, despite, despite as much scientific evidence that that is completely false. And it generates in people, it, even as they try to work politically together, I'm thinking about people on the left, 
all kinds of problems coming out of the way they were raised and the way they see other people as enemies. We don't see each other as the loving beings that we are. The, 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 the effect of growing up in, in this kind of a culture. You know, capitalism destroys each generation of, of, of young people. Their lovingness and their, uh, their ability to see each other as, as another human being that they can relate, relate to and love, not as an enemy, gets lost in the process. That's where I think we need to be working. Uh, see to it that, that, that um, and it's true for people on the left too, you know, they don't treat their children any better necessarily. It's, it, it's, that's where I think the, the, the progress can be made. And uh, in, in time, well, I mean, I'm also encouraged by what happened in, in Florida with the young people standing up, right? First thing that was done with that was to say, oh, they don't know what they're doing. They're just showing people. Young people don't know anything. They must be actors. Right? That's bullshit. Um, but those people are standing up. I don't know how much of a how much of an avalanche they're going to create, but um, I'm glad to see it. And, and I really think that, that that in the long run, we have to pay attention to how our children are treated, how the children are treated, and, and make that part and parcel of the politics of the world. I agree. Tomorrow, uh, uh, a line from a famous song, to treat your children well. I think that's true. To me, I'm sort of a traditionalist in the sense that despite a panoply of achievements and more than a few failures of 20th century socialism, all we have is us, the masses of humanity. And most of us are loving human beings. I mean, let's face it, some folks are. I don't think Trump is a loving being. I wish he were, in a way. He was at one time. That was probably about 65, 67 years ago in his case and so forth. And I think that we do have to sort of recognize that capitalists and white supremacists and misogynists, and there's a lot more out there than you might be crediting at this point, these are objectively the enemies of freedom. They're the enemies of working people and people of color. And I don't think the future lies in small groups of leftists or left academics dictating to other workers or people of color or women what to believe. But I do think what we all need to do as workers first and foremost, but as allies of workers, as other oppressed or subaltern group members, is to come together and ask, what kind of world is it we want to create? What did 20th century socialism get right? Where did we collectively, whether we're Marxists, Leninists, or other revolutionary socialists, where do we make mistakes? How can we avoid those mistakes in the future? I think we're capable of that kind of critical reflection. I think we're capable of learning from the past, both successes and failures. And I think that we really have to go down that route and rebuild a revolutionary left. Because again, I think Luxembourg was right. You know, your choice really is socialism or barbarism. And I think we're headed toward barbarism now. No, I mean, I would just add socialism or mass extinction is what I'm thinking um, that we're at, so. <clears throat> yeah. Awful possibilities, right? Barbarism is looking pretty good. Yeah, barbarism is <laughs> so bad. <laughs> okay, so you have a question? It's not urgent, but yeah. Can I just see the hands for the question? And, okay, so you have a question, then I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, you said that the left is weak today in this country. Um, question for the whole panel: Why, why is that? And how is it weak? And why is that? Why do, you think that? do we have a single mass revolutionary party in this country? The answer is no. We, no, we don't. We don't. Uh, well, when was the last time we had one? Uh, that therein lies the rub. The Communist Party had about a hundred thousand supporters by the end of World War II. It wasn't a revolutionary party. They had abandoned the revolutionary vocation years before that, and we can blame some of their leaders, some of whom were worse than others. Uh, we can blame the CPSU to some extent. Again, you're always wrong if you repress or restrain revolutions. You've got to take them when you can get them, and so forth. But that's basically been a historical failure in our country. It's not entirely surprising. If you think about it, the United States for you know decades, for generations now, has been the most powerful empire, the most destructive and lethal empire. Well, maybe with the exception of Britain, in the history of the world, certainly today more lethal 
And so it's not entirely surprising. If you think about it, the working class historically, you know, has had a certain kind of stratification. You've had the pernicious and vile effects of racism and white supremacy. You've had religious differences, regional uh, differences. You've had all sorts of political and ideological and cultural poisons that have made it harder for workers to come together. And so even today, you know, the good news is that in the era of Trump, some left organizations are showing, you know, some growth in uh, membership and so forth, and that's to be welcomed, but not like on the scale that you need. And again, like in some other countries, we've got like 57 different kinds of organizations, all of whom we're insisting that we're right and the others mean well but are wrong. And even now, in the face of a resurgent far right and open fascist with arms in the streets, it's hard for people to come together and say, I know we disagree about this and this, but let's work together anyway. It's sort of like bourgeois individualism works its way into left organizations and explains at least part of the sectarianism that we have. Um, so, you know, I think that we don't have a mass revolutionary organization. Even if you put together all the 57 different kinds of left organizations, revolutionary and not so, mainly not so revolutionary, our numbers are weak and limited. It's easy to understand why, but we need to do something about it. It's, I, the, I just sense so strongly the intense desire, maybe coupled with apathy, but also like those as like two part, sides of the same coin to do something and to affect change. I feel that from almost everybody I know, we people desperately want to do something. People on the left, but still, so it seems like that there's this desire, but still I feel like so many in this room would agree that the left is weak or even, you know, Platypus has the whole left is dead thing. So, so just that to, as a contributing to this dialogue. Okay. If there's this great desire and but, you know, if you look around the country, even in Houston, right. in Houston, we're the fourth largest city, New York, LA, the left isn't dead. There are people out there engaged in struggle, but not in the numbers and, frankly, not with the political effectiveness that we need. And it's sort of frightening to think that things will have to get a whole lot worse before a whole lot more people get mobilized. But one question that I would raise is, of your friends and associates and colleagues and coworkers, um, if you know a lot of people that know that you know things need to change. Question is, are they out there engaged in concrete political action on a weekly basis? Are they doing stuff for revolution, are, are or for helping to build movements, parties, and struggles that would promote revolution? Or for that matter, they would basically take on white supremacy or misogyny in a systemic and militant way. So it's basically people aren't willing to put in the work, to, to I, make some like think, I don't think it's that work. simple. No. As mentioned earlier, you think about how university education has sort of like deteriorated in certain ways, not just in distance education, but I'm old enough to remember, a phrase I get to use now that I'm in my 60s, to remember when university and college education was valued sort of in and of itself. The whole idea of a liberal education was become familiar with the world, yeah. you know, the human heritage and so forth. Not anymore. Today it's all about jobs, and that reflects the worsening situation for the working class majority. It also reflects, you know, more strains and pressures on what's left of full time tenured faculty or tenure track faculty and so forth. I mean, I, I would agree with that, but I remember getting an English degree in 1980, which is not much later than you. And the first question I got to ask in 78, 79, when I declared a philosophy English major, is what are you going to do with it? I mean, so I. I mean, I hate to be like uh, a funny annoying man or whatever. No, not, not at all. Like, um, it's like a political science degree, a bachelor's in political science. You can weigh tables, you can drive cabs, so forth and so on. But I, mean, I felt that way, but clearly the world asks you, you know, like, why aren't you an engineer? You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's a lot more of that now, though. I, just might I know, you, no question. Yeah, it's all careers. A whole lot more. Yeah. But and even in the 60s, there's the slogan. Sorry. I just wanted to ask you a question when to respond to your question. Oh, well, um, so the thing that I've been kind of surprised about is, um, in terms of the question about why is the left so weak, is uh, is um, I feel like my students like just uh, let me see, um, you know, sort of political categories that have been inherited from the Cold War no longer seem to sort of make sense now to sort of uh, younger people. You know, like so then I have a sense of what left and right means and. 
it's totally different from what my students understand by that. And um, like you know, I mean, now it makes sense a little bit more after the election, though. But I was surprised, sort of speaking, the students that were going back and forth between Trump and Bernie Sanders and stuff like that it was somehow the same thing for them. Um, and so, and then, and then you know, you have like white supremacists sort of. Um, uh, for, uh, you know, like endorsing socialism now, too, though. So I just feel like uh, we're far enough from the Cold War so that, like, the categories and stuff like that have just sort of, the meanings have changed, you know, like that. Um, yeah, I, I think... Uh, so I think we're asking people... Uh, or the left has been asking people basically to engage in combat with the power. Uh, us against them, we want you to stop this, we want you to end this, we want to do this, we want to do that. And it's, um, a, it's, it's a tough call to do that. Um, and by and large, the left doesn't have the power that they can make demonstrations, but the demonstrations can be called off. And it's difficult for people to get involved in that sort of thing. I, I think you have to ask people to do things that their love tells them they want to do for other people. That we can we can organize things like that. Um, I wanted to put on I don't know what's going to happen uh, a, a day of celebration and appreciation of immigrants and refugees. I'm told that some people on the left left say, "How can we appreciate them? What, what do you mean celebrate and appreciate immigrants and refugees?" Well, that comes out of seeing them as fully human and, and fully contributing to our world and to, and to our lives. And yes, of course, we want to we want to accept them. I think there are lots and lots of people who are willing to do that, who would like to do that. Um, and it doesn't involve directly, you know, uh, end ice or you know, uh, abolish uh, whatever. Um, but it can move a lot of people move them in a step into solidarity with each other. And I think that's the direction we have to go in. And um, Just if I can add to that, I've been thinking about like how in the 1960s you had this sort of European disdain though for the kind of you know race um, uh, problems they had in the U.S. though. And now that Europe is dealing with its own refugee crisis, they're not handling it very well at all. I mean, the Scandinavians and stuff like that, though, just sort of you know, I had this 180 degree sort of shift in their perspective towards outsiders and stuff, though, and, uh, you know, and that's, and that's, that's been leading to sort of uh, the populist backlash all over, all over Europe, too. Aaron, did you Okay, so I have a few questions. Uh, to, to use a, a uh, recent example, have you heard of the, uh, the Cambridge Analytica thing in the news? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, then found out, you know, that Trump hired this organization, Trump campaign had hired this organization uh, to that data mined uh, millions of uh, Facebook profiles, and they they weaponized that in the election. So there was this this outrage over that. But as a few might point out, the Obama administration, the Obama campaigns rather, um, uh, employed similar tactics during their their campaigns. So. What my question is, my first question is, does Trump make more apparent to the masses the absurdity of capitalism and provide a potentiality for like revolutionary zeal? Or will Trump just be seen by the masses as a bump on the road and like just just a need to course correct to this notion of normalcy? And my second question is, on the left we have an aggregate of various Stances. You have, you know, and comms, communists, socialists, and then Bernie Kratz, and who knows what else. There's also there's, there's this idea of that we can ha have an allowance for these different um, uh, perspectives and still somehow achieve power, e e giving respect to all these um, different stances. But is this? Is this idea of left unity helping us or is it hurting us? So I'm sorry, question. What's the idea of left unity and all that? The idea that that like we can have an, an allowance for all these other other opinions. We can have ANCOMs in office. So we can also have um, 
just you know uh, Bernie Kratz in office, and we'll, we'll all eventually sort of figure it out together. That's sort of kind of thing. I don't know anybody who thinks that. I've I've heard a lot of people that think that it's it's weird. In different circles is cool. Yes, it's fun. So, um, let's see, so I'm thinking about the war in Vietnam, like that that sort of uh, like event from the 60s in terms of this problem of surveillance, right? So I think a lot of that actually, you know, the way the data has become so important now begins the 1960s with the Vietnam War, though, right? Which is really kind of this large-scale data war, right? Where, um, you know, with McNamara and stuff like that, trying to quantify sort of all of these um, um, the, these variables on the battlefield and so forth, right? And all this information being gathered through surveys and so forth, though, that the generals were relying upon to sort of conduct the war. So it was really a war that was defined by surveillance, right? Um, and it, you know, set up some of <clears throat> set up precedents and stuff like that there with the surveillance state that we have now. But um, the other thing that's interesting is that the period was, the war was also defined by, you know, the power of, you know, like spectacle and mass media there. Because I've been thinking recently about how these two crucial moments during the war, 1964 though, when Johnson decides to escalate, 1968 though, um, you know, with the debt offensive, these were kind of um, um, sort of media events, right? Like, um, um, or, or caused by media events, right? Where Johnson... Well, but I was thinking more that Johnson sort of didn't want to make any firm decision about going to war because he wanted to wait until the election and would look bad if he decided to either sort of fully commit or withdraw, right? So instead he decided to, um, to accelerate the bombing as sort of this way of kind of waiting, basically. But then he realizes, right, that with all of the planes, right, you need sort of troops and stuff like that to protect the bases, though. So you have this ad hoc troop escalation. And then in 1968, there's another election, right, um, the North Vietnamese were sort of planning on this like, kind of spectacular effect of a big battle, and it was, a, um, it was a, a complete sort of military failure. This was the biggest military failure of the entire war, right? But it ended up, of course, being a big publicity, uh, like victory, though, for... And, you know, so, like, leading up to sort of Johnson's whole thing about, um, you know, if, like, Middle America and Walter Cronkite has abandoned me, right? Um, so, yeah, like, these two major moments of the war basically book um, are, you know, sort of... Um, largely motivated, though, by, like, uh, spectacle, right? Um, so, yeah, so surveillance and spectacle, I think, sort of play a pretty big part in terms of, kind of defining, defining that war. To, to get to the first question you asked about the effect of Trump in terms of producing more, um, more people who want to basically have a revolution, who want something very, very different from what he is and see what he is and want something else, as opposed to those who are sort of going to go over um, I, I don't know all the answers. My, my sense is probably more of the first kind. Um, I, that seems to be what's happening with the women uh, in Virginia, for instance. There were key people in, in who actually ran for office and who were in, <coughs> in winning those. I think they won 17 seats in the House. And most of them so I, I think that's probably what's happening, and the Democrats certainly hope that that's what's happening. Um, Trump is also of his own, he's really demolishing the empire. You know, he, he was opposed to the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. All the Republicans and Obama were for it. This was to solidify U.S. control over, this, over the economy of, of, of Asia. You know, and he blew that up. <laughs> you know, and he, he blew up the thing with the, with the, with the, with the Europeans. Um, and now he's, he's renegotiating NAFTA. It's really, what he wants to do is stupid <laughs> and harmful for the for, for the for, for the organization. And, and there's surely there's surely people in power who who see that and for whom uh, they don't want to see him come to power either. So so I, I, I'm more or less optimistic about it. Um, I want to get back to something I didn't quite say when I was talking about how we need to treat politics in these times. It's a distinction between power over and power with. We tend to be, in our meetings, we tend to want to win our position. We tend to want to win people to ourselves. We want to get the majority and do that. Rather than, uh, where are you coming from? What do you need in this conversation? Where, you know, what, 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 do we, what do you need out of this Green Party, for instance? What do you need out of, out of working together? Um, how can we do that? How can we, how can we deal with the problems that you got together? So not with you, you know, not with me determining how you do it, or vice versa, but working together. 
power with. So that that's that's not a style we got a lot of. Uh, it's not a style that the culture, the dominant culture, really gives to people, right? I mean, what, what is Trump about? He's about dominating people. That's his brand. You're fired. He's about there are some good people and there are some bad people. And he'll tell you who the good ones are, and he'll tell you who the bad ones are, and of course, the bad ones should all be punished, and the good ones, they should be the good ones. But the, <laughs> that's all bullshit, you know? That's not who we are. And, and we need to somehow respect the humanity and everyone we, we come into contact with, certainly in our organizations. Or, uh, let's just get two final questions. I saw Mike's hand up and Mark's hand up. So can we stack these? Just... Anyway, that's my take. Could be completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> it was great. Oh, yeah. So, Michael, a question, and Mark, and we'll stack these two. It's funny that Aaron brought up Cambridge, Cambridge Analytic because um, I was thinking of that as, as a measure for how confused I am. I understand that Trump didn't use them, and I'm trying to follow the media, the information I can find. And um, I mean, Cambridge Analytica is just one example of things that Trump did, but Obama well, I'm also. I'm saying that, that yeah. information, like I'm saying that information comes from NPR, and I hear I have other information that doesn't confirm. You know, like in other words, my point is I'm very confused by the information that I have. And uh, if we're talking about the left and the need for a revolution that that stops the uh, of barbarism and the atrocities of capitalism. Like, are we the metric, or like, how can we measure um, economic or political developments? Like, good Marxists, to try, you know, can we even do it here? You know, I hear things in this room that I'm like, this doesn't help me. Not to criticize, you know, like, even the questions and stuff, it's like, it's not that I don't think make good points, it's that I, besides being weak in my own mind, I'm like, I, I doubt some of the information that I'm hearing. You know, so like maybe this this country just is in advance as Germany was in uh, 1890 or something. You know, I mean we never happened, and we just happen to have the weapons, and they're very dangerous. And you know, so your comments on that out of out of 68, I guess, is I lost. Um, you know, like what were the chances of actually achieving a task, or you know, not being aimless. And if, if we're going to, if you agree, we should not be aimless, you know, um, and trying to, you know, like, so let's say advance beyond capitalism, um, you know, like where would you go in the world or what, what would you look at? As models? The, well, the, like, how can we measure it even, you know? Like, we're going we're gonna to take two questions. I'll summarize them at the end, but uh, Mark, you also want to ask your question. Uh, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you know the Vietnam War was a war of you know that and surveillance. And I think in it reminds me that in the 60s, I think it was the SDS that was organizing protests against ARPA and computer research and mm -hmm. networks going online. And just generally in the culture, there was a lot of distrust and suspicion of computers and networks as tools of surveillance and social control. And then that quickly disappeared. Yeah. And like there's none of that now taken over by you know, I know, like Silicon Valley libertarian optimism. <laughs> but why is that? Like why did that suspicion just fade away? Okay, so to try to summarize here, you're asking why how do we measure today? Yeah, whether or not the United States is even relevant in this discussion, I guess, in the word. And if if you know if we're not re relevant in like having some like like clarity with regards to the, the task of socialism, yeah. who might? <laughs> so how do we measure the progress towards the task of socialism? And you mentioned the protest towards um, this. It was kind of ARPA. ARPA, yeah. And why do we not see that type of uh, protest their action today as well. I mean, could I get clarity on what the ARPA? Uh, ARPA, ARPA or was, or was the, King, the pre King. precursor to DARPA. Yeah. To what? The, the precursor to DARPA. Uh, the Department of, uh, I don't remember what, what that stands for, but they were doing early, you know, computer and network research. Okay, they, yes. they, they made the uh, ARPANET, which is the precursor to right. the internet. It, generally, the SDS was protesting ar armament and different kinds of military research, generally, at, at the universities. So. 
just so yeah, who wants to try those questions? I'm still not sure I understand your question. If Does America have any sort of clarity on what socialism is at all? I can speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> I had five people on my radio show who were all socialists. Um, all five had different perspectives on what it was. Um, this is a conversation we are in the middle of. We are. Yeah. We, it's it's why we need to yeah. work with, with the power with you know with, in order to, in order to really fashion what what do we want here really what 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 can be. And that's one of the valuable things about forums and discussions like this. You may end up with more questions than answers. I, mean, I can say the same for myself. But at least we start to talk about, you know, what would liberation, what would emancipate, what would real freedom for all of us, or virtually all of us, look like? And, you know, as we think about what it would like, be like to perform work under conditions that are no longer exploitative, just thinking about that, that that's pretty heavy duty and not done in two minutes. Can we even imagine a world where you don't have white supremacy? Can we imagine a world where women are truly equal? Even that is, that's pretty head-banging if you think about it. But aren't those really worthwhile thinking about? It's like, what would it be like? How wonderful it would be? What are all the reasons it would be wonderful? And then you start to think about, and how can we get there? And inevitably that does have to be, you know, at least at some important levels, begun through processes of discussion and dialogue and debate and you know even disagreement and so forth, hopefully in not so disagreeable a way as some of us are famous for. You know, I think it's right to say that when we think about trying to reach out to others to not just think about what we want, but how to change the world in order to get it, you know, I think George is right at one level to think about we really have to think about trying to develop power with each other. At the same time, you know, I, I think we do have to recognize that we do have real enemies out there, and those real enemies are not simply misinformed people or folks who, to borrow a phrase from Halbrun, are never recovered from the blows suffered in childhood. There's some of that I know, but it's not just Trump either. Every president who manages the empire, you know, may have different psychologies and stuff, but they serve a certain social role. So yeah, there is a truth to saying it's like combat after a point and so forth. For me, the question is, how do you mobilize the man, the decisive majority of people who work for a living and people who care about liberation, you know, more broadly conceived? How do we move people to believe or believe again in the prospects for emancipation for all of us? You know, with very little harm being done, except for to the capitalist and the people who conduct mass violence in this country. How do we do that? It won't happen next month or next year. But at least starting to talk about it, what we want, what we need, and who's the we here, right? That's the beginning of wisdom, I think. Um, so, so I guess I would say that, that uh, well, a lot of people have characterized this moment as sort of a moment of crisis where people um, lack the, the imagination to imagine something different, right? Um, and they always evoke uh, that famous line by Frederick Jameson that sort of it's easier to imagine the end of the world though than the end of the capitalist mode of production, right? Which that, that seems um, to me to sum up pretty well though the situation um, that we're in, so. Anyone want to comment on Mark's question? Yeah, I don't know. They just they just sort of won, right? The, pe the DARPA people and the people who wanted to quantify everything, though. Um, but in a way, I mean, I was thinking with, um, like, uh, uh, Trump's election that sort of the, you know, data was kind of defeated, though, right? Like, they thought they could replace sort of, uh, like, uh, a journalism, basically, though, with sort of data collection, though. And the data said everything was going to go great, though. And, you know, um, but and, and which is which is sort of what happened in the Vietnam War, of course, right? Because all of the data, though, ended up sort of systematically distorting what was happening in the battlefield and then... You know, like the body count and so forth didn't give an accurate figure of the will of the enemy. <clears throat> I would just to gently diverge, just gently. I, I don't think that the fate of the invasion of Vietnam or the outcome of the 2016 election was really determined by numbers, quantification, statistics, or anything like that. You know, when you think about Trump, 
you know, his victory occurred because of a resurgence of not just white supremacy, but of real distinctions and struggles right. within the ruling class of this country. And I look at Trump as a sort of a successor to Patrick Buchanan, who's been pitching a certain kind of economic nationalism, or was for the longest time. Um, there are differences, and frankly, what the Trump election showed me, among other things, is not just the frightening resurgence of white supremacy in the far right, but also the utter bankruptcy of the Democratic Party, yeah. and the fact that we have to move beyond not only the Republicans, but also the Democrats. So for me, tailing the Democrats or hoping to take over the Democrats, it's like giving up already. We have to think outside the two-party system and outside the two bourgeois parties, at least it seems to me. I think, I think trying to get ourselves involved with, with the Democrats is just going to taint us. It's, it's, going, it's just going to make us all the polls, probably, pretty much. Well, they've been co-opting folks for, what, 150 years? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's just been working pretty well, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. How are they not capitalists? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Thanks.